Hey everybody, welcome to the Gym Masters Show Live. How are all of you? Those of you in the Northeastern United States and the Mid-Atlantic States and New England who just survived that monster nor'easter and uh, blizzard-like conditions, <laughs> hope you're doing well and hope you've been able to dig out of your driveway and your sidewalks. Uh, we got hit with some really good snow, though it is melting a little bit, but we had a little bit more snow just about an hour ago. I think it was about a foot and a half, roughly about a foot and a half of snow. And they're talking about uh, more coming our way over the weekend on, I believe, Super Bowl Sunday. This Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. So uh, <laughs> we have not had uh, this kind of snow in several years. We've been very lucky to uh, sort of skate along without much snow. We haven't had major storms, I'd say, in these parts. We're in the northeastern United States and the greater New York area between New York and Boston along the southern New England coastline, literally on the water here. And, uh, you know, usually we would be getting him, but uh, we're in a pocket here where we really don't get hit unless it comes up the coast. This one did. A nor'easter tends to come up the coast with the moisture from the south and then blends with the cold Arctic air coming down from Canada and boom, that's when you get those record snows. So even further inland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, upstate New York, they really got nailed with, I think, two feet of snow. So um, everybody's moving out and about, which is really good. And uh, it is nice when you see everything white and it's coated. Matter of fact, uh, we were busy today. I was on the air uh, hosting radio shows as well and with Close Up Radio. But in between, we even did some uh, <laughs> snow day digging out. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, of course, you know, snow blowers, and then we have people that come that do the driveway and all, but uh, we were shoveling and clearing things out as well. So uh, winter is uh, letting us know that it is here <laughs> in its fine style. And I think this was the weekend or coming up. Uh, yeah, I think this week, a couple of days is the anniversary of the 1978 uh, Northeastern blizzard, the blizzard of 78. Um, so we're in a snowy pattern here. And um, again, the kids love it, but school is very uh, discombobulated these days for the kids that are going to school because of the fact that, you know, some schools are, are not open and there's home learning and everything going on with COVID and all. But uh, so we toast all of you and we have some nice hot chocolate. The the uh, whipped cream has already melted, <laughs> but this was, whoosh, there's a nice swirler whipped cream here in our Pine Island, Florida mug from one of our lovely viewers, the faithful Mary Bishop sent this over Christmas. So this time I'm going to take a sip before it gets cold because I always end up making things like coffee and tea and hot cocoa and then putting it down. And all of a sudden when I go to pick it up, it's like ice water. Mmm. What a good night for a nice mug, a nice mug of hot chocolate, you know? Again, the whipped cream has sort of, uh, but something, you know, what's nice is when the whipped cream does melt, it adds a flavor to the hot chocolate. It melts, merges into the hot chocolate. Uh-oh, wait, wait, wait. This is going to turn into a food show. I best not talk food because we got a lot of foodies in this audience. How are all of you? This is our celebrating poetry episode, right? Yes, I mentioned we were going to be doing an episode celebrating wonderful poetry, um, and we are doing that. I've got a very special guest who's joining me in just a moment, uh, Debbie Tucson Kilday. She is here, and we are so excited to have her here. And she is uh, live and direct from uh, a beautiful part of New England. She's in Wolcott, Connecticut. And um, she is in the thick of poetry. She's an author. She's a beat poet. We'll talk about what that is. She's a writer, a publisher as well, and so much more. And uh, we're going to have her on in just a second. And we're going to be celebrating some of her amazing works. And then also, um, after we uh, have our fabulous conversation with Debbie as our guest, then I'm going to share with you uh, some poetry that one of our Loverty viewers sent in. Uh, some really beautiful stuff. So we're going to share that along as well. And then I have a few things, some of our master's mantras that I post on uh, Facebook and also share on YouTube. We're going to share some of those as well. So how is everybody? Say a quick hello here, and then we're going to welcome our wonderful guest, 
um, who is uh, so excited to be here. And we're so happy to have her here as well. Hope you guys are doing well. And again, hope everybody survived the snow. Those of you who didn't have the snow, you're lucky. Although it is really nice, you know, it's just the day of, it was snowing all day yesterday. Hello to uh, Jim and Lovety family from Merlin in Ontario, Canada. She certainly knows a thing or two about snow in Canada. Good to see you, Merlin. And Bernadette is here. Uh, hey, Jim and everyone. Good to see you here, Bernadette. Welcome. And uh, Maureen says, good Tuesday evening, Jim and Loveties. Welcome to you, Debbie. We are happy to have you here with us. We are happy to have you here as well, Maureen and Debbie. And uh, Maureen goes, so get this. I know the East Coast is getting socked with a huge storm. It was 84 where you are. You had to turn your air conditioner on in your car on the way home from the hospital. Crazy weather in the Arizona area. <laughs> uh, it was colder in Florida. Our family in Florida said that it was chilly. It was a whole East Coast chill. Mary Bishop. We're using your Pine Island, Florida mug with the nice hot cocoa in it, Mary. Hello, Jim and Lovety friends. Good to see you as well. We love having you here. Dante CD. Hey, welcome, Dante CD in San Diego, California. Hello, all Loveties. Welcome to Lovety Hall. Another captivating live show is right before us. Enjoy. Thank you, Dante. And you're the one who coined... I created the word Lovety, but you're the one that said this is Lovety Hall. I love that. And Debbie's all set. She knows all about the whole Lovety thing. So she's ready for her Lovety wave from our international audience. Again, this is an Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series. We started about 250 episodes daily with um, guests from all walks of life and fields of endeavor. And with great variety, every show is something different. Uh, hello, Jim and Lovety family. Love all the snow pictures. Thank you very much. We were posting those throughout the day. Juanito watching in South Africa. Hope your day is going well or your evening now. Good evening, Mr. Lovety. Good evening, Loveties. It's nice to have you here as well. Watching Linda in St. Augustine, Florida. And of course, we welcome everybody. Uh, on our various platforms, including YouTube, Jim Masters TV. We'll hope you subscribe to the channel. And uh, Krista is here. Hello from Greece. Nice to see you watching in Greece. We were just talking about Greece, Debbie and I, moments ago. I was in Greece two years ago on a television shoot project, and we were at Samothraki Island, and it was really, really beautiful. And uh, would like to go back to Greece at some point. Very nice to have you watching in Greece because I know it's very late in the hour. I don't know if you saw the episodes where we had singer Mario Frangoulis as my guest. You can see that on YouTube at Gym Masters TV and also George Paris was my guest as well. Years ago on public television here in America, I interviewed uh, Nana Muscuri. She's a legend uh, from Greece as well. And Amy is here. And it's poetry night, Amy. I know you're all excited celebrating uh, fabulous poetry. This is our episode theme today. Hello, Snowman Jim. Hello, well. Absolutely. And good evening, all the loveties. You as well. Hey, Joey Lorenzo is here from New York City. Good to see you. Good evening, Jim. Glad to see you as well. And Connor, how is my buddy Connor doing? Nice to see you as well. And also from New York City, Kathleen. Hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. Hope all is well with you all. You too. It's nice to see you here, Kathleen. I hope you're doing well. Crystal Nolan, who is in Connecticut. Hi, Jim and everyone. Happy Tuesday. I hope you're having a fantastic day. I'm glad to be watching your live show. I've been working extra hours as frontline healthcare. And God bless you, Crystal. And uh, you're one of those great workers. I'm looking forward to an exciting show with inspiring conversation. Love it. Our guest is also from New England, from Connecticut, from Wolcott, Connecticut. So uh, you got a neighbor here on the show. And Dante in San Diego says, we are great. How are you, Mr. Lovety? We are doing terrific. Tina is here. Good evening, Jim and Lovety. It's nice to see you as well. Tina, welcome to the show and all these fantastic Wonderful comments from so many great viewers from around the world. Everybody welcoming Debbie. Uh, hi, Jim and Lovities. Happy Groundhog Day. Lots of snow for you, Jim. Yes, uh, Punxsutawney Phil saw the shadow. I don't know how they did with the snow, but six more weeks of winter, I guess. Welcome poet and author Debbie to the show tonight. Looking forward to hearing poetry and a great conversation. Absolutely. And she's she's uh, very respected in the, uh, in the industry. Joy says, hello, everyone. Uh, you saw the Mario from Gulas episode. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you love the hat. <laughs> I know you love when I sport the hat, uh, Linda. Thank you very much. Gang, keep the comments coming. You can also comment during the show. 
uh, while we're here live and tell her your friends. Let me tell you about my very special guest. She's really amazing at what she does. And uh, she's been doing this for a long time. And she's one of the best in the business. Uh, Debbie Tosin Kilde is an author and beat poet and writer and uh, publisher. And again, she's been doing this for a long time. She's a next generation beat poet, award winning publisher, writer, nature photographer as well, illustrator, artist, expert, high roller slot player too. That's right. She's the owner and CEO of the National Beat Poetry Foundation Incorporated and its festivals, the National Beat Poetry Festival, International Beat Poetry Festival, and so much more, Goddess Festival. She creates and holds events that create opportunities for other poetry enthusiasts to come share their voice and participate in a safe environment. Musicians and artists are always included in the events. She collaborates with other poets, musicians, and artists worldwide and has created a Beat Poet Laureate program recognizing talented artists worldwide in an awards ceremony that's held usually each year during Labor Day weekend. That's right. Debbie is also a special events uh, director of the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association, organizes and acts as a manager of the Capper Bookstore at the Big E, which is the big festival in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, at the Connecticut Building. She's been doing that for the last 15 years. She's also the past president of the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association. She uh, lives in Wolcott, Connecticut, and she's the author as well of several books. She's had her short stories and poetry published in magazines and several anthology books. And she's also has appeared on uh, television and radio and so much more. We're going to welcome her to the show and talk more about her wonderful background and all the cool things we're going to share with you as we are celebrating fabulous poetry on this episode of the Jim Masters Show Live. Welcome to the show, Debbie. How are you? It's so nice to have you here, my friend. <laughs> Hi, Jim. I'm glad to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And you are in Wolcott, Connecticut area. And I'm sure you got a little bit of snow, huh? <laughs> About 15 inches. Yeah. <laughs> About 15 inches. But it is nice when you look out the window, you know, and it's sitting on the lawn and it's on the shrubs and the trees. It's it's uh, it's attractive to look at. Not great to drive in or walk in, but when you're looking out of the window and you're having a hot cup of coffee or, or hot chocolate and you're looking out and you're seeing it, it is kind of nice, isn't it? I like it when it just after the snow comes down and it's very quiet because no one is out. I like going out there at that time. Yeah, right after. I like that too. Sometimes in the early evening, uh, eight o'clock or so, right after, and you hear some of the plows and you just, it's, it's a cool time. Juanita in South Africa. Now we told you all about the lovity that we're famous for on the Gym Masters Show Live. Juanita in South Africa is welcoming you to the show, Debbie. Mm -hmm. Linda in uh, Florida says, good evening, Debbie. Debbie, you are now a lovity. I know. I am so honored to be. <laughs> Is it that? I tell you, there's all kinds of awards one can win in their life, but when they get a levity from the Gym Masters show live, I always ask the guests, I would imagine your feet are probably tingling right now getting a levity, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen in New York says, welcome, Debbie. And Mary in Florida says, welcome, Debbie, as well. And uh, really, really nice comments from everybody here. And of course, Christine welcoming you from North Carolina. Linda from Florida, and so much more. So you are in uh, Wolcott, Connecticut, and you're in a very special, the home you are in is really tied to the legend of your family, right? Let's talk a little bit about this fantastic place that you are in that goes back uh, generations. Uh, it was built, this home was built in 1939 by my grandfather and his friend. My grandfather did not know how to build a house, but in those days, people just did what they had to do, I guess. If they wanted a place to live, they built it. Something like that, I guess. Yeah, huh? Um, so it's brick, uh, mostly brick, that he built it out of. And uh, it was part of a 66-acre dairy farm. Wow. And I grew up here. Uh, there were no houses around. Uh, I grew up very nature-minded, I guess you'd call it. And uh, 
The only thing left to this area now is this house. Mm. Around us has been built up. Uh, built up. Yeah. 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 That's uh, it's amazing. You've been able to keep that little nice nook of where you are sort of preserved and sort of uh, in its natural state and natural setting. Does that location inspire your poetry at all? Some of the history, just the being surrounded by nature, does that enhance your work? Um, I would have to say that my work was more inspired by me taking walks by the Farmington River. Mm -hmm. I used to um, help a woman that owned a bookstore in Farmington, and it was right on the Farmington River. It was called the Mill Race uh, Bookstore, and that's now part of Miss Porter's school. Mm -hmm. What used to be that bookstore, and mm -hmm. and we used to have poetry events there, uh, and that was very inspiring to write. And I would also go down by the river and take photographs of the nature that I would see there. So early on for you, Debbie, when did you first get inspired by poetry? When did you realize you wanted to be a writer and you really wanted to make poetry a real emphasis as far as the, the writing that you do? Something that you've been doing since you were a kid? What, what were those early sources of inspiration for you to first be a writer, but then to have this real phenomenal emphasis on poetry specifically? Well, I, um, I've i always been surrounded by artists. Um, I used to, I used to be part of an art artist community in New York City. Um, and there were poets, there were musicians, there were artists. And I also was an artist uh, drawing and painting and making pottery. And um, I guess it was just all the creativity, but I have to tell you a little story about that. I was also uh, involved with teaching um, Tai Chi Chuan, the martial art. And um, Allen Ginsberg, who was part of the you know, founders of the Beat Generation, he was a student where I taught at one time. So Wow. So I guess. That's something, huh? Yeah, it was very, very much something. Mm. And um, so I was always interested in, in writing and poetry. And, but my favorite is, I have to say, my love of Jack Kerouac, um, who is basically the founder of the Beats, uh, along with Allen Ginsberg and uh, William S. Burroughs. Let's but talk about that for people who aren't as familiar what, what the Beats means and, and beat poetry and beat poet. Uh, define that a little bit for us in case anybody is watching and they're not as familiar what that means. Well, what it means to me is See, the, the original Beat Generation, they had a lot of emphasis on political themes that they would write about. Um, they were kind of, uh, you know, what was I going to say? Um, oh, boy, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> but they, um, That's because you're used to writing it versus <laughs> verbalizing it. <laughs> But anyway, to, to me, what happened with me is I wanted to give a voice to everyone, mm. uh, no matter what type of subjects that they wanted to speak about. And uh, beat poetry was important because it has no traditional form. There are no rules that you have to go by. Um, you can be yourself and you could you could talk about any subject you would like to. So that's what bo beat poetry is about. And I, you know, I still adhere to that. And people will come to me and say, I'm not a beat poet. I don't think I can come to your events. And I'll say to them, do you have something to say? 
And they'll say, yes, I do. And they say, well, then you're a beat poet. Then you're a beat <laughs> poet. You're a beat poet. That is fantastic. That's cool. Sherry Lee Leonard says, hi, she's watching. Good to see you, Sherry Lee. And Juanita says, uh, wow, love a house with history. He's talking about your house. Uh, Ann Wozniak says, good evening, Jim and Debbie. Good to see you, Ann in Florida. Christine Clifton, welcome, Debbie, to the show. You're now a lovety. I, too, love a quiet night after a snowfall. Bruce Bryant, uh, great friend, watching uh, from sunny California. Good to see you, Bruce, as well. Really, really nice. And Merlin in Ontario is asking, is that a tapestry behind you? It's lovely. She's fascinated by the wall hanging behind you. It is. It is the tapestry. Um, I basically put it up last night <laughs> so that I would have an interesting background <laughs> when I'm speaking to everyone tonight. What is the history of the tapestry? It's amazing. It's a lot of different symbols and really beautiful things on it. Yeah, um, it's just something I picked up long ago, um, basically in a head shop, I think. You know, and I, I put it up on the wall. Good idea. Good choice. It has, of, it has sun symbols and moon. And if you look, if I move over so you can see the, you know, it has like a sun symbol on it. Um, it's very nice. It's very peaceful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about, and they're saying beautiful. They love the back. Sherry Lee says beautiful creative background. And uh, Crystal is saying beautiful tapestry. Again, she's uh, coming to us live in the Gym Master Show live from uh, the town of Wilkett, Connecticut, which is a beautiful area. And um, so you were talking about some of the progression. What were some of the earliest pieces of poetry that you created, Debbie? Um, you would like to hear something? Sure, yeah. Is it from one of the specific books that you have? Um, no, no. It was just something that I had written long ago when I was involved in that poetry group in, in uh, Farmington at the Mill Race Bookstore. There used to be what she called uh, Sunday Readings by the River. You know? Oh, nice. And people really would nice. get together and and read their poetry. So now, tell us about uh, a little background on this one here that you're going to share with our audience. Well, I, you know, it's it's a good thing I became a lovety because I'm very uh, much into the, that idea that we do need more love in this world and more kindness. And this is one of the first pieces I wrote. Terrific. It's called... If love, if love is the opposite of hatred, if love shows respect and friendship, let's choose love. If kindness is the opposite of cruelty, if kindness melts hard hearts, let's choose kindness. If compassion is the opposite of tyranny, if compassion brings understanding, if love is all there is, let's show it. Let's do that. Let's choose love. That was one of my first pieces. That's beautiful. That is really, really beautiful. What, what inspires you? What are some of the things that do inspire you to create the poetry that you create, Debbie? I, I've always been a, a deep thinker. And I always, um, I'm always thinking of all different subjects. I always try to put myself in other people's situations. And I try to talk about certain things um, that, you know, are going on in the world that affect everyone. And, and that's what I, you know, that's what I draw from when I'm writing. You just uh, got a nice comment from uh, Amy Anglin, who's watching. She's also a wonderful poet. Uh, she says, that was beautiful. She's watching on our YouTube channel, Jim Esther's TV. What you just uh, shared with us, that piece of poetry, Amy says, is beautiful. Uh, Linda in Florida says, very nice. 
Krista watching live in Greece says great. Crystal Nolan says very beautiful. Merlin says love that Debbie. Um, and Sherry Lee, yes, pre-pandemic, same issues prevail absolutely. And uh, they're loving that tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> the tapestry is beautiful with great colors, designs. Enjoy your uh, house story as well. Bruce is saying wonderful, creative, very beautiful as well. Um, let's talk about something that you've been involved again, as much as you are a B poet, author, writer, you're also a publisher as well. Tell us about what it's like being involved in that side of this whole industry of poetry, also being a publisher. Well, I'm not actually a publisher. I do work with two publishers uh, who are also my advisors in the foundation, uh, Paul Richman from Human Error Publishing He's up in uh, Massachusetts. And then I have um, James Paul Wagner. He's in Long Island from Local Gems Press. And they actually do the publishing work for me um, for the poetry books. Do you oversee that when they are doing that? Are you uh, constantly in consultation and sort of making sure that nothing is taken out or altered or... What have we you? have conversations all the time about, uh, you know, who's, who, what content is going to be on there. But I do make all the, I do design all the covers. You know, for yes. The books. Yeah. Show us those. Well, I just, I'm just holding this one up. Whoops. Okay. It's the newest one from 2020, the anthology. Tell us about um, that one. Beat Generation. Yeah, tell us about that one. That's this one here. It's on the screen. Yes. So tell us about that. Um, every year since uh, 2015, we've had um, a Beat Poetry uh, Festival, a three-day or more. Sometimes it's been more. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and I, I try to put out a book each year. Um, an anthology and and all all different poets from all over the world contribute to it. Uh, let's see. This year there were two hundred and seventy one uh, different poets that contributed to this uh, one book. So there that's are quite a bit. So you get a lot of different styles and varieties in this book it's not all one uh style or flavor you got a good sprinkling of different people huh that's great i think that is the reason why people are so interested in um, my group and it's because i do accept everyone i want everyone to have a voice and a lot of different uh, groups are not like that they did have too many rules and they don't um you know, they don't accept everyone. There's usually judging and stuff like that. And, and I try to get away from that and just let people freely express themselves. So I think that's why people are drawn to this organization. Mm, that's fantastic. That's wonderful. I've got some more here. I'm going to show some folks some of the covers of some of the works, and then maybe you can uh, share some things about them. And we're going to have you share some more of your poetry as well, uh, which we are so happy that you're going to be doing for us during the course of our episode as everybody's hungering for it. Um, what did you think of, uh, was it was Gorman? the young lady who was at yes. the inauguration. Uh, she's really something. Have, have you had any uh, involvement or interaction with her at all? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> she's on the bucket list, yes. Well, when you do, we'll have you both come back as guests. That would be fantastic. Um, Mary uh, says- I, I have, I have uh, last year, I was very fortunate to uh, give a, in um, a lifetime award to two famous beat poets. Uh, one was David Amram, who was Jack Kerouac's musician. Oh, wow, years. yeah. 
and he's known all over the world. And and um, so, I mean, he couldn't come in person, but he did, he was on the broadcast online. You know, we we streamed the the program online, and um, and then also uh, Ann Waldman. She's in Colorado now, but um, she was also one of the you know founding uh, members of the beat, the original Beat Generation. That is cool. That is cool. I'm going to go through some of the covers here, and uh, you can tell us about some of these fantastic works. This one is fantastic. We are Beat. Tell us about this. That was uh, the anthology. cool cover. Yeah. Well, you created the cover too? I did. I created all the covers. Very, very talented. Um, but the drawing behind that was uh, drawn by um, a friend of mine, and he did that background, and I added, you know, I, I changed a few things and added a few things and created the cover. But um, mm -hmm. all those colors were his, you know, that he he created. Mm. And um, so it's like I said, it's just um, poets from all over the world contributing uh, their voice to these anthologies. Um, you know, and is it hard to gather them? Or are they like, oh, we love this. We want to be. Do they look forward to being a part of these anthologies when they're created? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're like, yeah, it's probably sometimes hard to fit them all in too right um we welcome everyone and and no matter you know there are deadlines as to how long you know we accept um you know people contributing to these anthologies but we fit them all in we try to fit them all in and um it's a beautiful thing because i i see every year there are different poets uh that are in these different anthologies besides the ones that are always, you know, in them. And then we have a following locally too. Uh, my events, when we were going, um, you know, when we were together, I should say, you know. Pre-COVID, yeah. BC before COVID, were, yeah. Yeah, they were uh, held in uh, New Hartford, Connecticut and, and, uh, and also in Torrington. Mm. So, you were telling me um, also that obviously we're in the midst of COVID right now, so people aren't really traveling, but you have plans and hopes uh, to get to Greece too, right? Yes. Um, the Beat Poet Laureate of Greece, Chris Avelisario, who made a comment earlier, I see, that she's watching. Yeah, from Greece. Um, yeah. She has invited us to come to Greece and Ooh. and hold the festival there. And uh, see, she's saying, great. There she is, yeah. <laughs> Live from um, Greece. And believe me, we need to go to Greece, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. And I said the event is yeah. three days, but you'll be there a little bit longer than the three days, right? Exactly. Um, and one of the other, um, the beat laureates, uh, Bent Bjorklund from Sweden, he is also, he's, he's uh, creating, he's an, a great artist besides being a, po a great poet. Um, he's creating a stage at his house so that when we go to Sweden, we could all get up there and recite our poetry. And That's great. So, That's you know, fantastic. People are very excited. Um, yeah, yeah. Very excited about this organization. And like I said, I... There's a need for it because um, people are usually not allowed to say what's on their mind. Uh, they're told to be quiet or yeah. keep yourselves. And I mm -hmm. think poetry frees you from those rules. You know, you're able to create and uh, say what's on your mind without getting blamed for it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I guess, right? I'm gonna read you a poem from this um, this newest anthology that came out. Oh, terrific! Excellent. It might it, it might uh, explain some of this <laughs> beat stuff. I must admit, I am beat, beaten down by experience, smashed to bits, ground down by pestle and mortar. 
made into a chalky paste, like pesto without the pine, an empty cone of intricate webs, a cocoon turned to stone. There is no escape, only hope that the layers that peel off my parchment do not take me down Kerouac Lane, left to howl at a generation beaten down and poor, but made renewed, sympathetic, pure, as was intended. A new generation forged from stones, but crushed into clay, made pliable, ready for change, sculpted from ashes, rising up in waves, renewed by waters, a jazzy ensemble pounding to the beat. So that was That's fantastic. Yeah. I really, so when you wrote that, what was your inspiration for that? That one's terrific. Well, I was thinking of um, what I call the COVID times that we live in right now. Yeah. And um, it's just, I, and I was thinking about the original Beat Generation and how they were, they were squelched of their creativity. Uh, they were told, you know, to be quiet. Uh, Jack Kerouac, he succumbed to his situation by, you know, um, you know, drinking. Uh, he became, a, you know, an alcoholic, and that's the way he died. Um, but um, in those days, people didn't accept, like Jack Kerouac wanted music with his poetry. Um, yeah. And that wasn't done before. You know, no. people had very strict forms, and they they wanted everyone to adhere to those things. We have some uh, questions. Uh, Ann Wozniak in Florida says that was lovely. And uh, Sherry Lee, Leonard asking, when is the anthologies, when are they published annually? When do they, when can she look for those? Uh, usually um, in September of each year, right after the festival, which is usually held, you know, Labor Day weekend. Fantastic. So keep an eye in September. Mary Bishop says such a beautiful poem, the one you just shared. Uh, Anne says, uh, lovely. Marlon says, wow, so much said in just a few words. And Christine says, that was great and could be relatable as well. And uh, Linda O'Dell in Florida says, who or what inspired you to, to write poetry? You mentioned a little bit of it earlier, but did you want to expand on that maybe for Linda? Um, like or is I it said, life I, itself? Um, I don't know. I, I just felt like writing poetry. Um, I had read different poetry from, um, you know, Jack Kerouac mostly and, and Allen Ginsberg, and they were beat poets. Um, and Diane De Prima, uh, she was a, a woman beat. And women in those days in the in the 40s 50s and 60s they were not allowed to even recite uh in public it was frowned upon and their families some of them ended up being locked up if mm. they went against their family's rules now for people who aren't sure of what we're talking about with that what is it about poetry and certain kinds of poetry that would get the negative reaction or this this sort of uh, censoring or you, you just can't write or can't express or um talking tell us about, about that talking about life or uh love even um political statements all those different things that some people try to stop us from talking about even now today. You know? Well, even Sherry Lee asks, uh, Debbie, how has politics versus COVID play into your material since last March and beginning summer, the November election, uh, you know, terrorism, 
the insurrection, all these different things that are just going on, uh, you know, here in this country and, and of course, globally with the, the health pandemic and economy and all the, all these major, major things we've all been witnessing and, and dealing with. Um, has that, if at all, affected your poetry and anything that you've been writing since all of this transpired? It does. I, I do have some pieces that I did write during those times. Um, I don't really want to read them because I, I don't want to, um, you know, create any sort of, right. No, I, I don't want to think about all that negativity and trying to be hopeful for the right. future. As soon as 2021 started, I felt like something, you know, like a great, uh, heavy weight had been lifted off of us and that there was hope now, you know. Um, even though we are still living in the pandemic, I know, um, I still yeah. have hope. I don't ever give up. And Juanita in South Africa actually asks, that, and she said she loved the poem that you just shared. Are you inspired more by happy or sad life events? And what mood do you write better? Well, I Good do question. have, I, <laughs> I do have a book of poetry that I had put out called um, Tantric Love Suicide. And it's a book of poetry. And I either write about very serious subjects or sad subjects or about love. I try, you know, to focus um, more on the upbeat parts, but I do, um, I think I do write a lot more about the hard times in life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read something to you now. How much of what you write is a reflection? How much of you would you say is in it, in the material, elements of your own experiences, your own life's journey, in the stories that are being weaved through your poetry? Well, that's a funny thing that you asked that because I write about all different subjects and I try to put myself in other people's situations and then write. And everything that I do write, people think it's about me, but mm -hmm. it's not, it isn't most of the time, actually. It's about what I would do if I was in that situation of someone else. Mm -hmm. That's how mm -hmm. I. I think of it, I guess. That's how you approach it. Yeah. What is the uh, material you want to share with us now, Debbie? <laughs> I might as well get the beat poetry <laughs> um, definitions out, you know, in the beginning here. Yeah. Yeah, that's us. A new generation, a beat generation. Where did we come from? It all started when Jack Kerouac decided he wasn't following the rules, a sterile set of sentences created from a set of words and ideas from someone else's mind. He wanted his own words, his own ideas, written and read the way he felt. He wanted music with his words. There was rhythm, but it didn't have to rhyme. We all want the same things. We started out from all different places, all different backgrounds, but we've come together as one, all different, all shades, a beautiful melting of flavors, just like in nature, we are diverse. We are unencumbered by the rules. You have your own form, your own words, your own style, and I'm free to have mine. We are free to be who we want to be. We seem to have some things in common. We speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. People who are put down, poor, forced to do as they are told, forced to follow traditions that deform and distort them from how they were born, squelched from feeling their own emotions. We speak for our mother, the earth, the trees, the water, the air we breathe. We fight for a more natural world, 
with the hope children get to grow up without fear of expressing themselves. Yeah, that's us. A new generation, a beat generation. That kind of explains uh, what I was saying before. It really, really does, and, and to the core. Um, that is fantastic, and everybody really, really responding and really liking what you're sharing with us here. And even Linda says, I absolutely love poetry. Uh, Paul Richmond, who is watching, he's got a great comment here. Welcome, Paul. You're watching on our YouTube channel. Anybody watching on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV, we invite you to uh, subscribe to the channel. We do shows live daily at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on the Jim Masters Show Live. Poets become the holders of the truth in this atmosphere of lies being the truth. That's an interesting uh, comment. Um, tell us what you think about that wording there from Paul. Well, I feel personally that this past year has opened up our eyes to some facts that we have been lied to most of our lives. The facts that we have been told were not true. Um, Things have been hidden from us. We've been told to believe certain ideas about the government, uh, our, our so-called leaders. Um, and it's been a great disappointment to find out that they were lying. You know, they were lying to us. Um, and our parents, you know, our parents they, they listened to whatever they were told and they did follow the rules without question most of the time. And I think that's why, you know, we're, we realized last year, especially that uh, we don't have to, you know, we can, we can find out and, and look into the, what the truth is and we can talk about it and maybe try to change the way things are run. So, how much of poetry would you say is for a larger purpose than just any sort of entertainment value? The pleasure of just reading the words and being sort of lifted and entertained by what you're reading and absorbing when there is a sort of a message and a, and a flavor and a theme to it. Um, how much of it would you say has that entertainment value in it? Or does that matter on what the theme is and, and who the author is and what style it is? I think the it's all about the passion that you bring your words out with. If you have a lot of passion, people are going to feel those emotions that you uh, put out there mm -hmm. and um, it's very important you know to to do that I think I think we've all learned um, you know this is from the COVID times as I call them yeah uh, that things do have to change um, we were brought to a halt everything we stopped were, we were brought to a halt and we had to look at what's going on and and try to um, make our voices heard in some way. And poetry is good for that. Absolutely. A couple more questions have come in here for some of our lovely viewers. And keep them coming, folks. You guys are doing great. And Mary Bishop says, love it, the last poem. And uh, Krista says, a beautiful melting of flavors. What a mm -hmm. great way to describe it, Krista. Maureen says that was fabulous. Um, Merlin, uh, Merlin in Ontario, Canada asks, are you allowed to express yourself about anything? Or I guess, you know, is there ever a holding back or how does it really work? Maybe for you specifically and or maybe others that you know. Any events that I have, I do not um, hold anybody back. Uh, of course, you know, we're not having fights and brawls or anything like right. that <laughs> but um anyone can talk about any subject mm. and i and i accept everyone 
uh, that's why I think I have such a following. It's been growing um, by leaps and bounds, actually. Tell us a little bit about that, the following and how that all developed and what's what that's like, Debbie. I'm not sure how it happened, except I, I guess I have to thank Facebook for that uh, because we were able to meet people from all over the world that we never would have met in person ever, probably. And um, once once people get to know you and they and then they tell you they're an artist or they're a poet or they're a musician or whatever dancer, you know, and then they start talking to you, uh, they they were actually surprised that, you know, I was a, allowing for anyone to contribute to the anthology books. Uh, I don't know what kind of experiences they had in their past, but apparently they they weren't being heard before. Mm. Um, mm. Merlin they asked, out. you know, they were, they were out of events. Uh, Sherry Lee says, I think after the fifties, after the McCarthy era, people were done and as a group were not listening and wanted voices heard. Uh, without voices, nothing changes. So thank you. Poetry, great for the soul. Paul Richmond says, if you believe in freedom of speech, then there will be things that you don't like to hear, but we need to hear and un understand why that person feels that way. I think everybody, um, like what Paul's saying, I agree, everybody should be allowed to come to the table and everybody should have a voice you don't have to necessarily agree with it, but maybe sometimes when you hear a different perspective on life, you actually look and say, you know what? I've been taking that uh, screw and trying to take the screwdriver and put it in and it's not working. It's, uh, it's taking me days and it's just not working. Oh, I've got the wrong screwdriver. <laughs> oh, just changing the screwdriver. And because this other person said, hey, Maybe this screwdriver might help you. Uh, I think we've become very, you know, separated in so many different ways. Everybody has different voices, but they won't necessarily bring them together. My hope is that we become more empathetic, compassionate uh, through everything we've been experiencing this year and even before COVID and pandemics. Uh, we rise from the ashes of everything, more empathetic, loving, compassionate, and we listen more. So many of us, everybody's speaking at, speaking at, and uh, only surrounding themselves by uh, the voices that they want to hear, no matter what, no matter what side or what, but you know, it's just uh, it's good to have other voices and other people at the table because that's how you learn and that's how you get exposure to a variety of different things, which is really beautiful. So what Paul's saying is uh, is so true. Merlin asks, "Have you ever been asked to write something for a song?" Once. Once you were. Ever. Tell us about <laughs> yeah. that. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't have it nearby or anything, but I I was asked to to write a song once um, by a woman. She now lives in New Mexico, and she writes some songs. And she asked me if I would write a song, and I did. Um, nothing ever came of it. It was a love song. It was kind of a love song. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. You know, I don't really, really remember much about it now. It was, it a was a, did you enjoy doing it? <laughs> well, when I was a teenager, um, I was going out with uh, my first boyfriend and he was in a band and I became a uh, part of that band at times singing um, at times and helping out with the band. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been around musicians and, um, and you know, been in, in the presence of people creating songs and stuff like that. So I, I've always been interested in that. Mm, that's maybe, fantastic. Maybe in the future. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. in the future, exactly. <laughs> hey, we've got another one here we want to share. Tell us about this. That's that festival. Now this is this started last year. Um, 
I wanted to create um, this goddess festival to give women from all over the world a chance to to uh, be celebrated and you know uh, share their voices and whatever subjects they wanted. But I, I wanted it to be a positive thing. Some uh, women organizations, they will talk always about women being abused and you know the negative things that happen to a lot of people. And I wanted this to be uplifting. So last year I created the first Goddess Festival and, um, and that was right before the pandemic uh, yeah. lockdown. It was yeah. the beginning of March of last year and the place was packed solid uh, with people and there was dancing, there was music and, and I even, um, I had bought these little crowns, uh, like, you know, princess uh, crowns and gave them out to all the women that were uh, going to be in the program and everybody was just so happy. Yeah, um, they were. I had a photo booth uh, brought in to the library, the Beakley Library in New Hartford, where the event took place, and people were taking their own pictures. And you know, it was it was kind of crazy. Food and fun and music and everything. And then all of a sudden, everything was locked down. You know, everything stopped. Maybe and this was later in conjunction with celebrating uh, Women's History Month, right? Yes, Women's yeah. History Month. And um, so I know I can't have one in person this year, so I'm going to do it online, just like the uh, yearly festival, you know, was done online last year in September. So um, I know I can't have monthly events. I could, but I haven't uh, had, you know, every month an event. So I, I want to make sure I have this goddess festival so that women can uh, be involved and because it is online uh, it'll be from women all over the world mm. they're all writing to me asking me if they can be a part of it and of course I say yes I don't know how many hours it's going to end up being <laughs> because I have people contacting me from New Zealand uh, India you know Greece Sweet Juanita in South Africa says, what yes. a great way to uplift and celebrate women. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to focus on the positive. Um, even though there's all these terrible things going on, um, we already know that. You know, I, I like to think of the hopeful things that could be, you know, in the future. And you have videos on YouTube as well for everybody to see, which I is do. great. Yeah, the National <laughs> Uh, Poetry Foundation, which is fantastic. And uh, I have some more I want to show. This one here. Tell us about uh, this here. Raising consciousness through spoken word. Yeah, that, that was last year's Goddess Festival. And um, that was also an anthology. All the women and the women that could come in person and the people that couldn't. They all contributed to that uh, book. Mm. Done by Local Gems Press in Long Island. In Long Island, New York. Now, okay. also, this year, as I mentioned, a nature photographer as well. And the Farmington River is a beautiful river uh, in Connecticut. Um, ever go tubing on it? No, no. <laughs> I know I it's new, known for the tubing. <laughs> uh, photographic journey and meditations. Um before we talk about that, does water speak to you? When I say that, uh, I usually, and I've shared in different conversations on our show, even off the air, for me, the ocean is one of my Zen places. Grew up, you know, here on the East Coast in New York, out east on Long Island, surrounded by, you know, the ocean on the South Shore, the Long Island Sound on the North. And then, you know, the Southern New England coast is surrounded by, you know, beautiful sound. And then further out, out, out you have the ocean. Um, swimming, surfing, boogie boarding, kite boarding, walking, sailing, floating in it, you know, just being near the ocean really is, um, 
very Zen for me because the ocean is larger than myself and has so much life in it, so much rhythm and flow and power. And I give over the respect and the power to the ocean. The ocean is bringing such wonderful life and joy and beauty and, and enjoyment and entertainment and all the things, um, even food as well oftentimes. Yet at the same time, it's in charge, not me. So I have a wonderful relationship with the ocean where I really respect it. And, um, you know, it, uh, we just have this symbiotic relationship. So it's probably because being here on the East coast, growing up near the ocean, it's been a go-to place for me, for you does bodies of water speak to, whether it's the ocean, whether it's the flow of a, of a river, like the Farmington river or a lake. How about you? Do you get Zen when you're near bodies of water, whether they're still <clears throat> or they have a tide? I love, I love uh, being by the water, uh, the ocean. Uh, my husband and I used to have a, um, a house in Vero Beach, Florida, and it was very near the ocean. And um, so I would go there a lot, you know, in the past. Also, um, even in Connecticut here, up at Meg's Point, <laughs> you know, you could find me there a lot, uh, just staring out at the water. Believe it or not, I do not, I never learned how to swim. Um, my mm. father was like a, a, an Olympic type swimmer, but I was never, a, uh, I never learned to swim. Mm. I don't know why. But I yeah. love the water. I love being on boats. I used to go fishing um, with my uncle in uh, off the coast of uh, Massachusetts. And uh, Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean, yeah, absolutely. So going back to this, then Farmington River recollections, your photographic journey and meditations. Tell us about this. Wonderful. This was my first poetry book that I published. I did publish this one myself. Um, I used my photography and then I wrote poetry to whatever I was seeing out on the Farmington River um, when I was at that bookstore, like I said. I, I used to actually be there almost every day uh, writing or taking uh, photographs down by the river and uh, I would just sit there. I would go so early in the morning, as soon as the sun rose, uh, before the bookstore even opened, and I would be just sitting there in awe of, you know, everything that, it was just so peaceful. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. what it is. It's just so peaceful. Um, and you felt, did you feel connected? Do you feel when you go to it, do you feel connected with either a higher power or the earth itself to nature? Does it give you an, an essence of feeling connected to things larger than yourself? I think what you were saying is there's a lot of beauty there in the ocean and the water. Um, it is in control, you know, yeah. there, is, there is that danger there that it could swallow you up if exactly. it wanted to. Um, if it wanted to, right. Yeah. That's how I look at it, sir, right? If it wanted to, um, it's almost as if we give it human qualities too. Like you respect me, I respect you and everybody will be able to play nice, but don't respect me, then who knows what will happen. Uh, like the ocean gives you that option. <laughs> One of the photographs in that book, uh, Farmington River Reflections, uh, I was sitting down by the river and all of a sudden I heard this bird squawking and I looked up and it, it actually dropped a stone on my head. <laughs> and I was like, I was in shock and I turned around and that's when I saw this beautiful... Uh, photograph that I actually took right after that, but I would not have seen it. It was of the sun rising on the river. I would not have seen it if I, if that bird had not dropped that stone on me. I don't know if the bird was trying to tell me, but 
Talk about an ah, talk about an aha moment. <laughs> that's a that's an ouch and aha moment. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Turn yeah, around. what are you doing? Well, all I can say, considering it was a bird flying over you, you're lucky it was just a stone. <laughs> Birds can do damage. <laughs> Here's another one. Now, I mentioned the high roller situation here. Now, those of you who like to play the slots and those of you who like to go to the casinos and, of course, uh, here in the Northeast, you know, of course, there's Atlantic City and others, but uh, the big ones... Uh, Really, New England would be Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun. Uh, and then, of course, the Encore, I believe, in Boston and MGM and Springfield. Tell us about this. No limits. How I beat the slots. Tell us. This is uh, intriguing. This book chronicles my first five years of playing slot machines. And... I had never been to a casino in my life. My parents were against gambling, told me that gamblers were terrible people. Um, and little did I know I would be ending up one of those people, I guess. <laughs> but um, I, I went there, it started in 2005. Mm -hmm. And my best friend was dying of a brain tumor, cancer. Mm -hmm. And... Um, she said to me, I'd like you to bring me to Mohegan Sun before I pass away. Mm. And I said to her, I've known you for 25 years. I didn't know you went to the casino. And she said, you'll understand once you go there, the stigma attached to gambling and gamblers. And um, she never got to go with me. The night we were supposed to go together, her and her husband and me and my husband, uh, she started having, you know, terrible seizures. And, um, but she wanted me to go by myself, you know, to experience it. And I didn't want to go. I have to say, I didn't want to go. But the first time I did, I did go because she was the type, she was going to ask me all the details the next morning, you know, when I saw her. So I knew I couldn't get away with not going. And um, so my first night there, I played a slot machine, a dollar slot machine, and I and I didn't even realize what I was doing. But because uh, that's that's a, a dollar slot is one of the higher. Usually, you know, some do the the nickel or the quarters, but you went right to the dollar. <laughs> yeah, the, do the first dollars dollar go fast. Bill. I had a hundred dollar bill to spend, and I put it in this machine. It was $3 a spin, and um, I was down to like 50, you know, $50, somewhere around $50, when I hit for $10,000, and uh, that was my first win, but... What did that feel like? I was in shock. I never saw that kind of money or won that kind of money or I, that did was my you, first time there and did the bug bite you to say "Ooh, i kind of like this maybe i should <laughs> play more and maybe i'm on a lucky streak or something here well what happened was uh the casino personnel in those days they they came over with a great big giant check you know and they they handed it to me they took pictures and they made, made a big deal out of it and they invited me to stay at the hotel and uh see paul anka the next night in concert mm. and i got to dance with paul anka and, did you really and, wow but um this started a whole trend of of course you would want to go back and, but i went back the next night and um the machine that i had played that first night was not available so i had to play a different machine and no matter what machine I played on, I kept winning. I won $5,000. I won $2,500. I won $10,000 again. Every machine I was playing, all different machines, all different types. Uh, but I was playing dollar machines, only dollar machines. And in the first five years, um, I won. I totaled it up one day. 
before I wrote this book, and I had won $8.9 million, all little wins in that five-year period, and $3.4 million after taxes. And, did, um, did I mention to you that I am also uh, your third cousin by, on your mother's <laughs> side? <laughs> well, of course. That's if there's any masters in your lineage. <laughs> <laughs> this is what people always say to me. But what happened was the first money that I won, uh, I kept that first $10,000. But everything that I won after that, I helped yeah. my friend. Uh, with her medical bills, uh, That's which beautiful. were outrageously expensive. And I made a promise to her before she died that I would help other people if I kept winning. I didn't know why I was winning at that time. Um, I figured it out, and that's why I wrote the book. But, um, yeah, I never kept it to myself. I shared it with other people um, People so that you that figured out like a certain routine or methodology or, or something about it that caused the those turn well, what, of events, what, win, 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 they, win? Well, after my friend Kathy died, um, I went to Las Vegas. I was getting all these different um, invitations from all over. Oh, you're, you're now a high roller, and, yeah. And, and I, I always said to people... Um, they don't sell your information. They give it. A, they give it away. Yeah. But I, so I was, you know, invited to Las Vegas, and um, my husband and I went for the first time. And before we could even, uh, it was it was the Las Vegas Hilton at that time when I went there. Uh, now it's the Westgate, I think it's called. But. Mm -hmm. um, it was such an experience. The first time I went there. I walked into the lobby before we even checked into the hotel and I saw a machine I had never seen before in Connecticut. So I went and I played that and I won $10,000 on that one. And, but this was a giant, like a seven foot tall machine. And I had never seen anything like that. And um, it played very slowly and no one was playing this machine. And because it played so slowly, it was like the, the wheels would come down, boom, 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 you know, each spin. Yeah. And um, so anyway, but while I was sitting there and it was playing that slowly, I um, I noticed that there was, I didn't realize it until that time that I was seeing something, I was seeing the programming behind the face of the machine I don't know. I can't explain it. My crazy brain had figured out the algorithm of the machines. Um, so anyway, I <laughs> I came to that realization that I would see different patterns as I was spinning that machine. And I would know when it was going to hit. And I, I still do. I still do to this day. Now, is it something that in reading the book people can look out for those patterns or is it something yeah. specific I, and unique to a specific type of person? Well, there are a lot of different factors that change. Uh, you don't know who played before you. Um, if they, you're always supposed to play, these are things I figured out myself. You're always supposed to play the maximum amount of coin as we put mm -hmm. it, you know, into the machine. Uh, if you don't, the machine uh, does not go forward toward the jackpot. It just mm. stands still internally. Um, so you have to play the max coin, whatever that is, on each machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, exactly. That is amazing. What's been the response to No Limits? I was... Um, Tortured. <laughs> <I was tortured. laughs> like, uh, I thought there were red carpets and everything else. You were tortured. <laughs> in Las Vegas, um, the first celebrity that I met was Barry Manilow. He was very, very uh, wonderful. He invited us to, um, you know, an after show party and uh, really got to know him. And he's still a friend. He invites me. To concerts hopefully there will be concerts in the future but 
he, he, he has never forgotten about me uh, since that time. That's beautiful, and, huh? Um, but anyway, in Las Vegas, I I won in the that first visit. I was there for th uh, three nights, three nights, and I was playing, and I won over six hundred thousand dollars. Once I figured out, like what I was seeing, you know, and I would play these machines that I thought would be winning, and um, well, I was searched. I was stopped you know yeah yeah what's going on and then right 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 yeah. right so almost like a mark deck of cards type of situation yeah um so you know yeah. what you were saying before um you know uh people wanting uh money of course you know um and if you can provide that for them they they did ex you know, they did come after me uh, wanting money, people. Uh, in fact, there was one night uh, at Mohegan Sun, I went to the furthest corner I could find there. <laughs> and I thought I was hiding out. There was nobody else there. I was playing machine in, in a corner where no one would even see me, trying to hide out from, I guess, what you would call fans. And um, this woman came and sat next to me, and it was Kathy Griffin. <laughs> the uh, Kathy Griffin, yeah, comedian. The comedian, yeah. And I looked over and I recognized her, and and uh, I said, um, "Are you hiding out like I'm hiding out too?" Yeah. You know? <laughs> and she said, "Who are you?" You know, she didn't, and I, so I told her, and um, she didn't believe it. But anyway, she we got to talking and she invited me to her show the next night. And after the show, she came out on the floor. I, she asked me where I played most of the time. And I told her and she came out onto the floor and she drew a huge crowd around both of us. And, um, she said, I didn't believe you, but now I do. And she said, can you give me some tips? <laughs> Debbie? <You know>? Right. <laughs> but, uh, I was, <laughs> you know, continuing to win. I was winning an awful lot. Did you, do you still play or did you stop? I do still play. I'm not supposed to admit that too much, but I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah here and there and still doing well when you do or hit or yes. miss still no, doing well. Yes. Very well. Uh, that's But I, I mostly give the charity and one of the biggest, uh, which is beautiful that, that bothers me about, about things is hunger, um, food insecurity in this country, which is outrageous. But um, uh, Local Gems Press, uh, James Paul Wagner, he does this uh, program, Bards Against Hunger, where a bunch of poets, you know, get together. It's usually in October of each year and, and we write poetry, uh, to and we we collect food and we give to the food banks wherever we live and uh, i'm i'm really into that idea of using poetry to contribute to different causes mm -hmm. uh, around the world you know that's beautiful that's absolutely beautiful did you have some more that you wanted to share with us some more poetry there i do have this one poem here about a friend of mine. She passed away now, but while she was alive, she lived in Bloomfield, Connecticut, and mm -hmm. she she had lost her husband, and she would um, she would find these copper pennies after he died, all over the place, and she would tell me, "I think that you know my husband is trying to." get in contact with me. And so anyway, after she mm. passed away, the first, I was in California visiting our son and his family. And the minute I walked out the door, um, there were all these pennies on the ground and wherever I went, there were pennies. And still, I still find a few pennies like where you would never think you would ever see a penny. And I, so I wrote this poem about, about that experience, um, about her. Cynthia was her name. 
You left me copper pennies today, but I wanted you instead. In case you're wondering, folks, copper is the metal of choice of the dead. It amplifies and echoes from the heavens of those who have left us behind. But I can't hear your voice only think of you as a shiny copper coin. You scatter them often to show me you're here, but it isn't enough to take the pain away or the lack of your presence, my dear. I know you've moved on to the heavens beyond and being I can't have you anymore, I'll pick up the coins as they drop from above. Mm, that's beautiful. So this, you know, so very poignant too, you know, and uh, why do you think it's as if maybe it seems in recent years, poetry has, um, and of course with Amanda, um, at the inauguration that spurred even more searching and, and wanting, but of poetry, but it seems to have had a resurgence in recent years, more in the limelight, people appreciating it more, people giving it a second look. Um, what do you think that is? Are people searching for something in their lives, their sole purpose, the meaning of life? It seems in recent years that poetry has been, again, the light is shining on it in a beautiful way. I think, like what I had said before, people use it as a tool to express their feelings without getting uh, arrested for it, I guess, you know, because it's just your opinion when it's a poem. Um, in other words, you know, if you were out there just protesting, let's say, you could get arrested. If you're reading a poem about issues that are important to you, you're not likely to get arrested uh, because it's poetry. So I think people have recognized that they can, they can say things about different subjects and be heard. Uh, they're not gonna be stopped. It's, it's an art form instead. Yeah, right, it's exactly. It's considered an art form, which, right, exactly, and that puts it into a different uh, category. Um, here's another. That was the first um, anthology that was, that I, those were the first uh, Beat Poets Laureate that were named, um, you know, at that time. That was the first book that was put out. Um, Mm. Don't ask me what year that was. I think it was 2016. <laughs> I think it was 2016. Mm. And um, and then that was the second one, uh, the second book to come out. That was 10 years um, of poetry that I had been involved with. And uh, this Wooden Branches is just a picture book. Um, mm. There are no words. It's trees. Um throughout the different seasons. But I want to tell you about this cover. I do all the covers, I told you. Yeah. This cover is a photograph of this tree that looks like something out of the Wizard of Oz to me. Doesn't it? It looks like it's alive and it has a face and everything. Eyes. I, I see eyes and a nose and a mouth. I know. that That's a tree that was in East Hartford at the library. Um, I went there to see another author uh, talk about her book. And and when I was getting in the car, you know, I looked up and it, that tree was next to me. And I was like, oh, my God. Like looking right down take, at you. Yeah, I'm going to have to take a picture of you. <laughs> That's amazing. That's incredible. And then there's this one. That's a little chap book, a little book uh, that was published as a gift to me from Local Gems Press. Uh, this past December, uh, and I, it's it's very small book. It has like fifteen poems in it. But I, I used uh, this gift, I should say, to publish some poems I have about trees and nature. You know, just trees and nature uh, poems are in that book. Do you have that book near you? 
I do. You want to share anything from it? Let's see. What do I have here? Okay. It's like you're surrounded by all your little children. <laughs> the books are like your kids. Mm -hmm. You nurture okay. them and take care of them. And Okay, here we go. The forest is many things. The sun filtering through the canopy, creating an ambiance of warmth. The fronds of a fern curling tightly into a ball as dewdrops lay upon it. But as nightfall descends, shadows aren't always what they seem. Trees stay silent so others can be heard. Songbirds lay in their nests up high, singing their songs softly as they fall into slumber. Frogs chirp in unison as fog creeps in, providing them cover from predators. An owl silently descends upon an unsuspecting metal bowl who becomes sustenance for its young. A family of deer walks slowly to the riverbank for a drink. A skunk waves its perfume to keep others at bay while it digs the soil for grubs. For some, it is their home. For others, a meditation, a contemplative, peaceful place. Sometimes beautiful, sometimes brutal. The forest has beauty as well as honest tones. I wish for the forest to continue undisturbed by those who destroy its peace and its purpose. Yeah, yeah, I love that one. As a as a nature person myself and a lover of trees and all that's that's a great one. That speaks that literally speaks volumes, huh? Hmm. What what I, were I you do have one about snow. Oh <laughs> yeah. Being topical. Have... <laughs> Hot off the presses. Yeah. Tell us Let's hear about that one. Kind of has a double meaning, but yeah. it is about snow. <laughs> it snowed, but it was already cold. Inside, the tendrils of ice wrapping your heart surrounded me, making me stiff without emotions, devoid of empathy, just as you showed none to me. After years of struggling, trying to break free of your grasp, stifling any emotions, finally free, just as the turtle cut from the ropes of the fisherman's net, rushing back to sea, flying through currents to a place of safety. Reflecting back, I see there are places that melt human suffering, bringing erratic hearts to a steady beat, finding solace in the fact there is hope after the snow melts. I like that. That is really, really nice. Really, really beautiful. Um, Amy, who is here, who actually sent us some poetry we're going to be um, sharing a little bit later. She says, any advice to a new writer from somebody who's been doing it a long time, an expert like yourself, Debbie? Uh, try to find your passion in whatever you do. Get very passionate and write from your heart. It's very important to write from your heart and don't be afraid of your emotions. Let them out. The best poetry is usually from built up emotions and people passionately blurt them out whether it's poetry or song or dance or whatever, they express themselves uh, passionately and you'll be okay. You'll find your voice. Who are some of the poets over the years that you've always gravitated towards that you have always enjoyed? What poets? Yeah. <laughs> I try to, um, I try to gravitate toward those that are unknown, mostly, um, that have become part of my 
poetry circle. Um, I have the California Beat Poet Laureate, Rich Ferguson. Uh, he is a wonderful poet. Um, he, he talks about all different, the plight of society, um, you know, people struggling in uh, California, the homeless. There's a big problem, you know, there with people being homeless. And uh, he talks about all those issues. Um, a past U.S. Beat Poet Laureate, Paul Richmond, that was making some comments earlier. He has, um, he writes poetry and he puts it to music. And he has a program he calls Do It Now, a group mm. called Do It Now. And he writes about all different uh, you know, the water, uh, the pollution of the water and, um, you know, the Native Americans, their plight of the Native Americans have been uh, very, very abused through the, you know, through the years. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, mm. and people of color, I mean, we can't even break the surface on that subject, how they have been abused and treated badly. Uh, it makes you ashamed, you know, it makes you ashamed at times. Mm -hmm. When you, you look want, back, And yeah. you want things to be changed. Uh, and that's why we have these movements going on now. And that's why we have these poets, uh, you know, cropping up from everywhere. Um, Mm. But anyway, there's uh, there's you have many another? different poets. Uh, there, yeah. one of my uh, past international beat poets, um, besides Chris Velisario that we were hearing from before, from Greece. I also have Donna Allard um, up in Canada, and um, she's a very she has uh, some wonderful pieces that she writes about, they're all wonderful. All my, you know, all the poets that I know, um, I could name them all, but I, I could tell you about the first poet, a beat poet laureate that was named uh, through my organization. And that was uh, George Wallace from Long Island, New York. Mm. And um, he is a very important poet. He's traveled the world He's written about all different subjects. I can't say enough wonderful things about him. And I do. I, I, I wouldn't even have time to read um, poetry from past writers, I should say, because I'm always being exposed to new writers. Uh, and I, I want to embrace them. I want to give them credit. I want to find them, you know, give, acknowledge them uh, for their work. Um, I become like the guardian of the beats. I think. <laughs> you know? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Keep this yeah. going on, you know. Yeah, yeah. Native uh, Canadians, Karen Campbell Green's in Nova Scotia, went through a lot of suffering too. We have a native poet, Rita Joe, who has written a lot of poetry about indigenous uh, issues as well, and uh, Catherine, who is in Maine. <clears throat> poetry, literature are all powerful. Uh, change agents as well. I agree. And Linda in Florida, uh, writings of love is poetry in motion. Sherry Lee Leonard, well said words are like a painting. Very, 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 very true. Um, really nice. Uh, Juanita really loved the forest poem. She's still commenting about the, the one about the nature and the forest and the trees, which is fantastic. Um, what are some other types of work that you do even outside of poetry that keeps you connected and keeps you grounded and sane and, and creative, Debbie? I am always uh, trying to contribute to the food banks, um, the local food banks, uh, because like I said, it's, it's uh, something that's near to my heart. Uh, when I was a teenager, um, my parents were divorced and I was living with my mother 
and we did not, my mother was in a terrible car accident and I had to cancel my plans of going, going to art school um, in Boston and I had to get a job. And I struggled to provide, pay the rent, uh, buy food and all that. And my mother was injured at that time. So um, she was kind of helpless and depended on me. And at one point I had three jobs I was working um, different jobs just to try to make ends meet. And, and I would always make sure that my mother had a lot of food to eat, uh, because she was in the house, she couldn't get out. And, um, and I, she would say to me, uh, Debbie, you know, why aren't you eating? And I would say to her, um, you know, I already ate at lunch or my boss brought me out to to lunch and that was a lie. I, I was just telling her that and I, I wasn't eating that much myself because I didn't have the money. I didn't have the money so that that's kind of a thing I'm a stickler about is food insecurity. Mm. So I try to help people as much as Which I can. A lot of people are experiencing right now as, as we've witnessed uh, which is extraordinary and, and absolutely uh, unbelievable when you really, really think about it. Um, and these days, day and time uh, that that would even exist. Um, you're working on several new books too, Debbie, a poetry book and erotic romance <laughs> and a story about human abduction and slavery based on true events that happened oh. in Connecticut. Tell us about some of these upcoming projects that you're working on. Sounds fascinating. The, um, the book about the uh, human abduction in Connecticut is based on a true story of a girlfriend of mine. She actually had gone to the beach um, one day and she was approached uh, by a man and um, he asked her if she wanted to go and have a drink with him. And she said, yes. And he abducted her and she just disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, everybody that loved her was looking for her for two years. She was a missing person. And after the two years, um, I got a phone call from an unknown number and she was calling from her abductor's uh, shack in the woods and um, he had her chained uh, for two years until he yeah. allowed her to make a phone call and she called me and I, I know it sounds crazy but I I, I didn't, I wasn't afraid. I wanted to go and see her and help her. And, um, I went over and as I got out of my car, I had to walk like, uh, five or six miles into the woods <laughs> to where she actually was. But when I got out of my car, I was told to park, you know, on the side of the highway, basically. And um, when I got out of my car, there was a gun to my head from her abductor. And, and then he brought me to where she was. And uh, I don't know why I didn't have that fear, but I didn't. And I, 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 I thought maybe he would try to abduct me also, but uh, somehow I was able to get around um, that, and, uh, I ended up bringing food to them, uh, because they lived in a shack and there was no water, there was no services or anything. They were like living out in the woods basically. And, um, he was a Vietnam vet and he definitely needed help, you know, mental health help, uh, but for some reason, he, he let me go and visit them. I don't know if it was because she was so unhappy. And I did try to free her from her captor. 
Um, but you'll have to read the book to find out what happened. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's just a little preview teaser, exactly. <laughs> just a little teaser. That is. But this a, that went is... on. This went on for about two, three years, uh, where I had this involvement with her and her captor, mm. and um, mm. the fascinating uh, experience and story to be told. Uh, the erotic romance, um, I started writing before the Fifty Shades series. <laughs> I, they beat me to it. You know? <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I just, uh, like I said, I, I write about all different subjects. And um, I, I wrote, I'm writing to um, talk about like how people try to look for love or they feel they're not worthy of love and they you know they go looking for things that where they could find those things in themselves but they don't know it yet mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so that's going to be an interesting book uh that's just about finished i mean i should be publishing that book but i haven't yet <laughs> you know and another poetry book too huh yeah, yeah. I'm always asked about. I, I have too many poems, I think. But <laughs> I, I, I'm always asked to, you know, when are you going to come out with, you know, your own poetry? Because I'm always helping other people. You're helping publish, others. Uh, you know, their own poetry or their own uh, manuscripts. One thing that did help me um, is when you know my involvement with the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association. I have met all different uh, authors, writers, uh, publishers, uh, marketers of books, mm -hmm. and um, and I I help those people. I've I've done many many different covers for different uh, authors. Um, I usually didn't charge them. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't be saying that, but you know they were people that they wouldn't have gotten their book out if they, you know, they didn't have the money. So like I said, I do try to help people. I do try to help people. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, Catherine says poetry is your beautiful gift. Thank you for sharing. Karen in Nova Scotia, where can we buy your poetry books? Um, they, my books are on Amazon. You can look for my books on Amazon. They're you just look there. for your name yes. and they're there. And um, and the foundation too. It has a uh, it's a website, right? There's a website, yes. a dot org website. Yes, National Beat Poetry Foundation dot org. National Beat Poetry Foetry dot org. That's National Beat Poet B E A T National Beat Poetry Foundation dot org. Right. Sherry Lee Leonard asks Debbie, "Have your books been optioned for films? It sounds like the new books would make each make great films." Well, my No Limits book about the slot machines, um, some of uh, Ron Howard's people read my book and they wanted uh, Ron Howard to make a movie out of my book. Um, wow. He didn't have the time to, to do it, um, but he did contact me and tell me that he really liked the story and... Uh, so there's still a possibility that it could eventually it could. happen at some point. Yeah, it could be. Mm. There's always hope. <laughs> like That's said, right. Yeah. Hope's Can't eternal. No, 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 no. That that's really amazing, huh? That's gonna, really, really cool. I'm gonna read you a poem now. Yeah, that would be great. What is this one? No one said it would be easy. No one promised you success. If you were to remember, no one really could care less. There wasn't any hints or instruction manual on what to do. For a semblance of a life, all you had was a made up promise that you would be all right. Your first mistake was trusting what others told you to be true, especially when they too had no clue as what to do. You see, no life comes with instructions. No one else can predict. 
for what it, it, it all comes down to is you're trusting the voice inside your head. Only you can run your life, fail miserably on first tries, learn lessons as you go along, and if you're lucky, survive. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Very meaningful and, and uh, very impactful. And Crystal Nolan was watching in Connecticut, actually. Thank you for sharing your beautiful gift, Debbie. I would like to buy your books. Mm -hmm. So again, you can get them on Amazon and there's the spelling of her name. Look for uh, the author right there. And uh, ah, go back and revisit with Ron. <laughs> How about Spielberg's people? Another group always hunting for new work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good idea from Sherry Lee. Uh, wow, how meaningful and powerful, which is exactly what uh, I was saying. And Sherry Lee also says, you're so kind helping those to get voiced, others that you're helping. Do you really, you really enjoy that, helping others get their voices out? It's actually become my passion now to make sure other people get their chance. Um, they're not you know, stepped aside and left in the corner or whatever. Right. Exactly. Exactly. What, uh, what are some things that continue to bring you great joy and blessing in all of this work that you do and have done for so long, Debbie? I, um, well, I'm just happy. I'm happy to be alive. I'm happy that I can still be able to help people. And I try my darndest to keep doing that. I just, I'm driven by that idea that, uh, and it's, it's really because when it comes right down to it, um, we've all had times in our lives where we have suffered uh, one kind of suffering or another. And I don't want anyone to ever feel like I have at times, you know, in my past. And I want to try to make the world a better place for everybody. That's what drives me. Those are beautiful reasons to be doing what you're doing, my friend. Really, really beautiful. Um, I anything have one, I, have I was going to say, yeah, poem. I'd love to have one to, uh, to sort of cap it. That would be wonderful. It's called The Last Poet. The last poet has died, or have they? I hear a voice, it calls to me. It's one of many voices. I hear the words still relevant today as they were then. Thoughts and ideas cannot be silenced. No one can erase their mark. I'll use my voice and be heard just as those before me. Voices no longer heard are etched in our hearts. Today it's your turn. Speak up, poet. We fight for the good. We matter. Without our words, there is no hope. Without hope, there are no words. There is no last poet. We keep recycling. I am just the first to speak. Then it's your turn. That's a perfect one to, to wrap with. Yeah, I am the first to speak and now it's your turn. I love that, I love that. You're brilliant at this, uh, Debbie. You are living your bliss. You are living your calling. You're living what you uh, were placed on this planet to do um, in such a ph phenomenal way. And I'm sure you, you sometimes pinch yourself and say that, right? Well, I'm getting to really do work that I love that doesn't even seem like work. It's just flowing out of you. Mm, I try. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, folks, she's quite humble as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I try. I always say I'm just a regular person. Some extraordinary things have happened to me, but really I'm just a regular person. 
Exactly right. Debbie is the Debbie you'll see in the supermarket as the Debbie she is here live on the Gym Master Show live. Absolutely. Karen in Nova Scotia. Um, and you and I have known each other for a while now. So it really is a delight to have you as my guest on the show, Debbie. Um, Karen Campbell Green in Nova Scotia says beautiful. And Merlin says uh, it's been awesome to visit with you tonight. And just like what you said, it all seems to come naturally to you as well in a way that, uh, you know, you know, it's just an essence. It's a real reflection of who you are, Debbie, as a person. Beautiful. Thank you, Debbie, for your time and sharing your amazing poems and and life with us. Um, Thank this you so was, much for having uh, me, Jim. Really. This was a pleasure, and you're welcome back anytime. And again, like you and I were chatting uh, before we went live on the air. Hopefully, we'll be able to get together. You know, once we're able to do that, and maybe break some bread. Um, that would be really, really nice, Debbie. And uh, thanks again for all that you're you're doing. Kathleen Walker in New York City says, I've always liked poetry. Tried to write some when she was in high school. Never give up, right? Keep going. Keep no, doing it, never right? Never give up. Never yep. give up. And uh, you see her name right there on the screen, folks. Look for that name on Amazon. And again, uh, nationalbeatpoetryfoundation.org also is the official uh, website as well. Debbie, you're a delight. And thanks so much for joining us here on the show. Um, Karen says, thank you, Debbie. This was wonderful. And Amy uh, says, thank you as well. And stay tuned, everybody, because we have a few surprises we're going to be doing in just a moment here on the show for all of you. Amy says, uh, great time with Debbie. Absolutely. Maureen says, thank you for all your soul-touching poetry this evening. And that's from Maureen. Debbie, oh, even more, Sherry Lee. Uh, all our lovities are sharing their love. Uh, poetry writing is tough. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. Jim. Yeah, this was a pleasure. This was a pleasure. And I really appreciate you hopping on and sharing your, your passion and your real understanding of the human condition and nature as well and the way that you are you can transfer it into beautiful poetry. And somebody else that was uh, one of our cast of characters joining us that loved it too was uh, George Burns. <laughs> Thumbs up from George with a cigar and all. He loves it. He's one of our regular cast of characters here on the Jim Master Show Live. Debbie is a natural lovity. Yes, Karen in Nova Scotia says that, and I agree. Uh, Mona says, thank you for being here tonight. Beautiful inside and out. Yes, I do love that tapestry behind you is a hit. They've all been talking <laughs> about it all night. You might want to just leave it up. Yes, I do love your background too. A great show tonight. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> boy, if that was yours, you could be offering those on the show too. No, God, really, really nice choice. Debbie, again, cheers to you. Best of health. You stay well there and, uh, the family home there in Wolcott, Connecticut. And uh, thanks for gracing our presence tonight. And I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed your time with me as much as I certainly have with you. You made me very comfortable. I, you know, I, I love it for you. I love, love it you for that. <laughs> I like that. You love it me for that, for making you feel so comfortable. That's, well, it was my pleasure and something that, like what you do with your work, just as natural. I don't know any other way. You know what I mean? It's just naturally. For, I have a desire to like to make people feel warm and welcomed and non-judged and comfortable so they can emote and express and share. And you do that wonderfully. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Debbie. You be well. You take care. Keep up uh, all the great work. Keep me posted. Let's stay in contact with some of the new things you're doing. And uh Maybe one of these days we'll take the show on the road to Greece. That would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. You have a good night. Take care. And would you believe we almost chatted for two hours? Oh my God. It doesn't feel like that, right? <laughs> no. No, it never feels that way. So, uh, so go stretch those legs. <laughs> and thanks for being with us, my friend. It was wonderful. Bye-bye. You. you have a good night. Bye-bye now. Is she not amazing? That was Debbie uh, Tosun Kilday, live from the beautiful family home in uh, Wolcott, Connecticut. She's a brilliant uh, beat poet and uh, author and writer, as well as uh, somebody who just really cares about uh, really lifting others through her work, but also helping others get to a comfortability in a place where they can 
uh, express themselves as well. Other poets, uh, whether they are, you know, be poet laureates or they're just up and coming writers. Uh, speaking, uh, we thank Debbie very much for joining us on the show. And again, uh, you can find her work on Amazon, uh, as we mentioned. Don't go anywhere because we have a nice surprise for you as we continue our poetry celebration episode. And thanks for all the great comments tonight, too. Some of the works, again, a nature photographer as much as she is a, a poet as well and a wonderful illustrator. I mean, she, she creates uh, these covers, too, which are extraordinary. And these are just some of the different works over the years. This was a cool story about No Limits, How I Beat the Slots, huh? That really is fascinating. I think a lot of people are going to be uh, <laughs> heading to Amazon and getting that one. I, somehow I sense that. Uh, and of course that. And then the uh, Farmington River Reflections, my photographic journey meditations, as she loves the beautiful Farmington River, which flows through um, the central part of Connecticut. There's whispers as well. And talking about all of these, if you missed anything in this episode, you can go back and watch uh, the full uh, show on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. Again, we thank our wonderful friend Debbie for joining us here on the show. And uh, now I want to share your, share with you, all of you, something quite special. One of our lovely viewers, actually, remember I was saying a couple of weeks ago, send in some poetry that maybe you have written or that uh, you'd like to share that's uh, one of your favorite poets. Well, one of our lovely viewers who has been uh, watching and really enjoying the Jim Masters show live and really expressing it, she sent us some of her own poetry. And uh, that is Amy Anglin. And we are very, very happy to uh, share it with you here on the show. We're going to uh, call some of it up. And I think it's really appreciate, we really appreciate the fact that she sent it so we can share it with all of you. Again, all of the uh, material we're going to share right now is again, courtesy of Amy Anglin, who has been actually commenting tonight and really enjoying this uh, poetry celebration episode of the show. Here is our first one uh, as we have our poetry celebration episode continuing, again, courtesy of Amy Anglin. Uh, the vastness of the ocean makes me feel so small. All the things that trouble me seem insignificant, if at all. A peacefulness washes over me with the sound of every wave. The ocean sings a lullaby. Life's problems fade away. As the sun begins to set and night begins to fall, the ocean never sleeps as a new day will be upon us all. I stand along the beach with my feet buried in the sand. I give thanks to God above for holding me in his hands. Isn't that beautiful? And for those of us who love the ocean, as we've been talking about, uh, that really is, and again, that it was uh, written by Amy. And thank you, Amy, for sharing that here on the Gym Master Show Live. That is absolutely beautiful. And uh, the ASME that you see on the bottom, she said, is uh, the combination of her name and her mom's name. Her mom has since passed away. So uh, that's how she signs it on the bottom. The ASME, combining her name and her mom's. We have some more from our lovely viewer, who is also, again, a poet and a writer. And uh, she said she's just really starting out. Well, I'll tell you, she's just starting out. She's really good at it. Uh, again, courtesy of Amy. When the heart opens, light shines in. A beautiful soul glows within. Blossoms like a budding rose. Opens itself for love to show. That's beautiful as well, isn't it? Again, all courtesy of Amy Anglin, one of the Gym Masters Show Live regular Lovety viewers. And we have some more from Amy. Again, thank you for taking the time uh, and responding to the opportunities to send in poetry, which we had mentioned. And Amy uh, jumped on it right away. This is also from Amy. Take my hand, Lord. Walk with me. Hold me close and take the lead. Through the trials, Lord, help me stand, guide me apart, guide my heart, that is, follow your plan, all the joys, Lord, peace you give, 
show me how to love and live. Hmm. That really gets you thinking too, huh? Doesn't it? I'll read that again. Take my hand, Lord, walk with me, hold me close and take the lead through the trials. Lord, help me stand, guide my heart, follow your plan. All the joys, Lord, peace you give, show me how to love and live. Very beautiful. Again, written by uh, Amy Anglin, one of our wonderful lovely viewers, sharing it here on our exclusive Gym Master Show Live poetry celebration episode. And we have another one here from Amy. <laughs> oh, no, this is the other one we showed earlier. Really, really fantastic, isn't it? Um, I really love this one. Let me read this one again. The vastness of the ocean makes me feel so small. All the things that trouble me seem insignificant, if at all. A peacefulness washes over me with the sound of every wave. The ocean sings a lullaby. Life's problems fade away. As the sun begins to set and night begins to fall, the ocean never sleeps as a new day will be upon us all. I stand alone along the beach, or I stand along the beach, that is, with my feet buried in the sand. I give thanks to God above for holding me in his hands. Absolutely beautiful work, huh? Amy, uh, thank you very much for sending in that beautiful poetry. Uh, they are all beautiful. They are beautiful. Merlin in Ontario, Canada says as well. And uh, I would buy Amy's poetry, Linda in Florida. And uh, Sherry says some great work submitted, Jim. I agree. Absolutely. Linda in uh, Florida. So beautiful, Amy. Crystal Nolan in Connecticut. Very beautiful, Amy. Juanita in South Africa. Very beautiful, Amy. Tina says so beautiful. Kathleen Walker says nice. She's in uh, New York City. And uh, Maureen says uh, fantastic, Amy. I love it. And uh, Linda O'Dell in St. Augustine, Florida says, now Amy is a natural poet, loved that poem. They, they all are amazing, aren't they? And um, I think the one for the ocean, right? The one, <laughs> the one about the ocean uh, was, yeah, that's a Jim Masters one if I ever heard one, right? Mentioning so much how much I really love the ocean and how it's a Zen place for me. So Thank you, Amy, for uh, submitting and sending those things along, those beautiful works of art. You, uh, you've got some really incredible uh, views on life and the world, and you're sharing it with us through your poetry, just like Debbie, and uh, breathtaking, magnificent. Thanks again, Amy. And we'll do another show like this, too, because I know you guys love this. And Amy says, thank you all. You are very welcome. And again, thank you for sharing that with us uh, and sending it to us here at the Gym Masters Show Live. We really uh, love them all, my friend. Very, very nice, Amy, watching on our YouTube channel. Anybody watching on the YouTube channel, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We would love that. While we were chatting, we got a photo sent to us, uh, Joy Lorenzo in New York City, watching and uh, with her grandson, Connor. Now, Remember I said earlier, we uh, had a snow day today. I was on the air earlier, but we had a snow day with all of the foot and a half of snow that we got here in the Northeastern United States with the Nor'easter that came through. Well, Joey Lorenzo's uh, Connor, her grandson, was playing in the snow. Cutie, isn't he? Isn't he a cutie? She just sent this uh, actually moments ago during the actual show. And um, we thank you. So there is uh, Connor, beautiful Connor, uh, Joey Lorenzo's wonderful uh, grandson. It says trouble on the hat. <laughs> Thanks for sending that in uh, as we were on live. So playing in the snow, shoveling the snow, but we are playing in the snow as well. So Connor and I are sort of uh, <laughs> on the right path enjoying the snow as the snowstorm had come through here in the Northeast. Beautiful shot of Connor. Thank you very much for sending that in, uh, Jory. And yes, handsome young man. Absolutely. I agree with Mona. 
have Amy share more of her poetry, please, Mr. Levity. We sure will. Absolutely. We sure will, Amy. Um, thanks, Amy. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, Chris is saying thank you to Debbie. Chris, thank you for joining us uh, late into the hour in Greece. Love it. Tell all your friends in Greece about the Gym Master Show Live. We would love that. Juanita says in high school, and after I wrote a lot of prose, all in Africans, so couldn't share. Uh, Sherry Lee says, adorable. Love playing in the snow, and the kids make it super special. Slay and play. Two cute guys. Ah, Connor and I, thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> we appreciate that. I want to let you know tomorrow, award-winning choreographer, yes, Jeff Whiting is with us here live on the show. It's going to be an amazing show. He is here. And then uh, historical fiction author, Kevin D. Miller is going to be here. He's absolutely amazing. He's all excited. He's going to be here on Thursday live. And then from the very popular New York Theater Barn, both Jen Sandler, uh, who's Associate Artistic Director, and Joe Barrows, who is the Artistic Director of the New York Theater Barn, are both going to be here live on the show. Jen and Joe will be my special guests coming up on Friday, then on Saturday, live from Ireland at a very special time, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, and 6 p.m. in Ireland, Scotland, France, GMT. Lynn Hillary, wonderful singer and songwriter, originally with the very popular female group Celtic Woman. She is here live this Saturday exclusively. Again, that's a special earlier time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Pacific, and 6 p.m. it'll be in Ireland, Scotland, and England. Uh, brilliant singer, songwriter, musician, as well as teacher, too, in Ireland. She's all excited. She's going to be here live exclusively on the Gym Master Show Live. Lynn Hillary coming up this Saturday. Don't miss it. It's going to be incredible. And then uh, the following week, and then, of course, we have guests all next week, too. But the following weekend, Brian Dunphy is going to be with us, also live from Ireland. He's on February 13th. And uh, he's with a very popular group, The High Kings. I've known him for years, interviewed him on television. Wonderful singer, songwriter, and musician. Brian Dunphy is going to be here live from Ireland on February 13th as well. And we have guests uh, every single day just about uh, booking all the way into uh, mid-March now with guests. Some of your favorites, actor Sean Kanan is coming back. Kathy Garver is going to come back. Dream of Denver is going to be coming back as well. Uh, wife of Bob Denver, who played Gilligan on Gilligan's Island, going to be joining us uh, as well. Matching blue in the snow. Yes, uh, Juanita, myself and, and little Connor, right? <laughs> cute photo, cute photo. So uh, that was great, wasn't it? We had a great time tonight. And again, don't forget, wonderful choreographer and director Jeff Whiting is here on the Gym Master Show Live, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, on YouTube at Gym Masters TV, also on Facebook at Gym Masters TV. Uh, share the lovity. If you haven't liked the uh, Facebook page, we would love that. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, all at Gym Masters TV, Periscope and Twitch at Gym Masters TV, and of course, YouTube at Gym Masters TV. And if you missed any of the episodes, there's over 250 episodes of the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series for the enjoyment, pleasure, to have them all there for you uh, on our YouTube channel. And a couple more comments coming in. February 13th is my oldest daughter's birthday party. Fantastic. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to your oldest daughter, Linda. Big, big, big event coming up. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, gang. We had a wonderful time tonight. And as we always say here on the show, there's a few things we always say. Uh, don't forget to smile and share the smile. It's one of the best contagions out there. Don't forget to share the lovity. Don't forget to find your Zen place. Mine, of course, we talked about the ocean. The ultimate is with loving family and friends. That's always numero uno. And then, of course, um, writing and music and tennis and cycling and so much more. And my work in television and radio and multimedia, on camera, on air, stage, 
for networks, TV, radio stations, production companies over the years. That's another Zen place for me is the work that I do, which I love doing um, as well. And as we always say, when we wrap up the show, we always tell all of you, relax, breathe from the diaphragm, love one another and love yourself. Not every day is going to be perfect. Not every day is going to be a golden day. However, make the most of it. You're here, you're alive, you're breathing, and life is short. So celebrate every moment that you can and try to have some positivity in your in your day and relax and try to get some Zen moments for yourself. We always show this at the end of every broadcast of the Jim Masters Show Live. So we toast you and you and you and you and you, as we always say famously here, on the Jim Master Show Live. Share the lovity. Tell everybody about our show. We're here uh, just about every day, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, like the social media platforms. Follow us on uh, YouTube. And uh, tell everybody. Tell all your friends to tune in and share the lovity. We have so many great shows in store for you with guests from all different backgrounds. Every show is something unique and something different. A few more comments from our Liberty viewers internationally, and then we'll get ready to say sayonara until tomorrow. Cheers H2O from Linda in Florida. Kathleen says, uh, <clears throat> have a great night. Good night all, Loverty hugs to all. You as well, Kathleen. Karen in Nova Scotia, good night, Jim, and good night to my family of Loverty's. You as well, you be well there in Nova Scotia. She loves when I say Nova Scotia. And, um, <clears throat> Thank you, and happy birthday to your daughter, too, Linda. Absolutely. Maureen wants a group hug. All right, everybody, get in there, get in there. All right, there you go. There's your group hug. <laughs> Can you feel it, Maureen? You got the uh, group hug. And uh, have a good hump date tomorrow. That's right, uh, Wednesday as well. A couple more, and uh, Teresa says, I wait for you in Greece to relax with the beats. I like that. That sounds pretty cool <laughs> to relax with the beats. The beats almost sounds like a, a music group, doesn't it? The beats. Uh, thank you, Jim, for another fabulous evening. Wishing you and everyone a good night and sweet dreams from Tina. You as well. Juanita in South Africa. Great show. Thanks, Jim. Love the variety. Good night, everyone. Stay warm. Absolutely. You too, uh, Juanita, where I know it's very late where you are, late into the hour. Uh, it's tomorrow already. Crystal Nolan says, good night, Jim and everyone. Thank you for a fantastic show. The pleasure is always mine. And uh, thank you, Jim. I may have to write again. So that's terrific. Uh, some of the poetry you just saw from Amy and, of course, the conversation of poetry you uh, got witness to uh, from Debbie has now spurred on you considering writing again. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Linda says, good night. Mr. Levity and Levities, thank you very much. We appreciate that. 292? Wow, that's a lot of shows. <laughs> Thanks. I have to count them up. I've been so busy doing the shows and then balancing this with my professional work in the daytime, which gets busy. Um, I didn't realize we did that many episodes back to back of the Gym Master Show live entertainment lifestyle talk show series. Debbie is so incredibly inspirational with all her poetry and stories. Many were extremely fascinating. Writing, creating is definitely healing. Thanks for this great conversation. Jim, keeping it real. Christine Clifton in North Carolina. You got it. Thank you very much for noticing that as well. Um, authenticity is a grand thing. So is empathy and compassion. And while having a laugh or two, right? You gotta have a good time. Mona says, uh, Thank you for tonight. It was a great show. Enjoyed it. Love your video of the snow yesterday. I uh, hope you and all the loveties have a great night. Hugs to all. And to all of you, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. We'll be back 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific uh, here on the show. Once again, we thank uh, Debbie for joining us here on the show. You can find her work on Amazon. And uh, tomorrow night, Jeff Whiting, wonderful award-winning choreographer and director is going to be here live. That's going to be an amazing conversation. We're going to love it. Great week of guests throughout this week. So cool stuff, cool stuff. And hope you enjoyed our very special poetry celebration episode. It really was a lot of fun. Um, 
You know how I do master's mantras, right? I've been doing them in video form on YouTube, and I've also been doing them for years on Facebook, actually, and people have said I should write a book and collect them all. Before we go, I just wanted to share a couple of ones that have been posted over the years um, on the Facebook page, Jim Masters TV, and also on Instagram and Twitter and on YouTube. Here's one that I created and had shared. If you have your health... If you are happy, if you are loved, you have three of life's greatest gifts, hashtag master's mantra. Um, they're always positive. They're always uh, observing life and they're always trying to inspire people. Here's another one. Live life gracefully, thoughtfully, confidently, respectfully, honorably, empathetically, and fully, hashtag master's mantra. And another one that we shared uh, that I wrote and shared on the Facebook page, uh, as well as on YouTube, Instagram, and elsewhere, each day is a gift, a blessing, and an opportunity to inspire and to be inspired. Hashtag Master's Mantra. So some of the uh, Master's Mantras that I've been sharing for years, actually, uh, that I create, and I usually, <clears throat> they just come into my head. They, I don't sit and like think for hours about them. They are coming from the heart and the soul and then out and then whoosh, I uh, post them and share them with you. So gang, thanks for being with us. You guys are the best. Keep sharing and tell everybody about our series and we'll be here for more great episodes just for you. For everybody at the Gym Master Show Live, you have a great night, gang. Okay, you be well. We'll be back here tomorrow on the Gym Masters Show Live. Another comment coming in and we'll wrap it up. Love the mantras. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Juanita. I love doing them. I've done them, I think, for about five or six years now, at least. And people have said, you can collect them all and put them in a book. You know, I really should. I really should. We've done some videos on the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. There is a section that says Masters Mantras, and you can check those out as well. Good night, all. We will see you tomorrow. All right, you be well. And thanks for joining us on the Gym Masters Show Live. Take care and be well.